Welcome to the Three Down Nation podcast. I'm Justin Dunk, joined by John Hodge, otherwise known in French as Jean Hodge, and <laughs> JC Abbott, aka Jumbo Cheeseburger. We're discussing Corey Mace finalizing his Saskatchewan Rough Riders coaching staff. Some CFL quarterbacks restructuring their contracts. CFL most outstanding rookie Quantez Stiggers aiming for the NFL. Chris Drevler's potential, and I stress potential, return to Bomberland. And Simone Lawrence's future in Steeltown. But first... The Edmonton Elks and Toronto Argonauts made the CFL version of a blockbuster trade with Chris Jones shipping perennial all-star defensive lineman Jake Ceresna to the six and Canadian receiver Curly Gittins Jr. heads west. Why do you think this guy's – guys, why do you think this trade happened, excuse me, and which team got the better end of the deal? Well, this is an interesting trade. Right, because you have an all star, perennial all star, heading east to Toronto, but Curly Gittens is Canadian. Jake Serezna is not. From a sheer foundational perspective in the CFL, it's, it's generally ill advised, right, to give up a Canadian to get an American back. The Canadian talent pool, as we know, is far more limited just from a sheer numbers perspective. It's also generally not good practice to trade an older player. And get, or pardon me, to give up a younger player to get an older player back. So, from that side of it, I, I kind of like this for the Edmonton Elks because they can pair Curly Gittens Jr. back with McLeod Bethel Thompson. Curly Gittens Jr. went off the chain with Toronto in 2022 when, of course, Bethel Thompson was the franchise quarterback. He was an East Division All Star, had 1,100 yards that season, sensational. That being said, anyone who's put on the tape and watches Jake Ceresna do what he does, not just on the interior of the D-line, but coming off the edge as a 290-pound man who can move like butter, man, this is an amazing pickup for the Toronto Argonauts. Would they pair him with Flo or Imolade? That D-line, though they're probably going to lose some top talent, possibly in free agency to Saskatchewan, maybe even to Edmonton. That unit is going to be great. So to me, I almost would call this a mutually – I get this is maybe me sitting on the fence a little bit. I would call this a mutually beneficial trade. Yes, Edmonton will miss Jake Ceresna, but you can't overlook getting a Canadian receiver who has been an all-star, who has been a 1,000-yard guy. And with all due respect to Gavin Cobb and Vincent forbes Montbleu, who who are already in Edmonton, is a significant upgrade for that receiving core when it comes to Canadian talent. I'm not going to sit on the fence, Hodge, because I think it's pretty clear who won this trade. It's the Toronto Argonauts. And I can't believe I'm saying that because of all the things you mentioned about Canadian players and having those foundational pieces. But just look at this exchange. I would argue that Jake Ceresna from a pure pass rushing standpoint, what he can bring to the table playing inside or outside. He's an elite defensive end, just as he's elite defensive tackle is a top 10 player in the CFL, maybe even top five. And now you're going to pair him with floor flow or a who is also a top 10 or top five player in the CFL, depending on how you look at it. That is going to be a potent, potent defensive line. Now, Curly Gittens Jr. could get back to the top form he had in 2022, specifically playing with McLeod Bethel Thompson. But if you look at last year, he really, really struggled, not only with injuries, but also when he was on the field. He just couldn't seem to get in sync with Chad Kelly. And there really wasn't a point during the season, guys, where we were watching that Argonauts offense and we're like, wow, this really isn't working without Gittens. Right. That <laughs> guy, he, you know, they need him to, to be a top receiver. They were working just fine without him. Tommy Neald was stepping in and doing a fine job without him. Now, that's not to dismiss how good Gittens can be as a player. I think he's a top flight Canadian receiver in this league. But receiver is a position that relies on the people around them. I think you can find guys who can elevate at that position and there will be someone who's like, well, you can't get another Canadian receiver like Curly Gittens Jr. They're just not out there. Well, Toronto found him in the fourth round. 
of the CFL draft. There's receivers out there that you can find and you can build up and you can make the next Curly Gittens Jr. without the price tag. Edmonton has had a bad history of paying receivers in recent years. They've got another big price tag on Gittens, albeit for a Canadian guy this time. But I just don't know if he's going to bring the same amount of value to their passing offense as Jake Ceresna is certainly going to bring to the pass rush in Toronto. To me, it's easy. The Argos won this trade. They took a spare part and traded for a perennial all-star level player on the inside and the outside of the defensive line and a guy that the last two seasons has had a double-digit sack total. Quick question for you guys. Do you think there were more receivers in the CFL in 2023 that posted 1,000 yards or more players, most of them defensive linemen, that had a double-digit number of sacks? I'm guessing it's uh, the former based on the point you're trying to make. Yeah, I would agree. <laughs> Hodge is too smart. I already said he's smarter than me before. He caught on. 11 guys had 1,000 yards receiving in 2023, and only seven players had a double-digit amount of sacks. I mean, there's probably an argument that Sean Lemon could have got there if he had more time games played in the league in 2023. But alas, I think that to me is where – the Argos win this trade, the value at that position, how dynamic you need to be as a pass rusher, especially in the CFL and the guy that can do it on the inside and the outside. And the fact that Curly Gittins Jr. can be really good. Hodge mentioned it, had his best season with McLeod Bethel Thompson in Toronto the year they won the Grey Cup in 2022. But the Argos have other guys at receiver that they really like. And Gittins Jr. wasn't a major factor, I would say, with all due respect, on that team that tied the CFL record for regular season wins, going 16-2 and in 2023. So they have other dudes. Tommy Neal has been mentioned. Dejan Brissett, David Unger are other guys there that can step in and fill the role. And I think you can argue that, at least from an athletic standpoint, Brissett is further ahead than Gittins Jr. and probably always will be, but he needs to realize his production potential to surpass Gittins Jr. But I also do think somewhat from Edmonton's perspective, this makes sense. They needed an upgrade at Canadian receiver. And if they're going to go out in free agency and sign an impact maker at defensive line, like let's say Anthony Lanier, who has ties to Jason Shivers, who could end up on that defensive coaching staff with Chris Jones, then it might make more sense to Elks fans. But in a vacuum, when you look at this one for one, I think Toronto wins the trade. I do think that we are downplaying the significance of a Canadian who can reach a thousand yards receiving since 2019. There have been three guys to do it and they've all each only done it once. Curly Gittins Jr. Did it. He had 1100 yards in 2022. And then this past season, Sam Emelis came up just shy of that with the riders and Nick Dembski just reached a thousand yards with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers in his final outing. So that's four seasons, albeit one of them shortened to only 14 games. Three guys. And Curly Gittins Jr. is one of them. And he's 26. Like signing this guy or, or acquiring this guy, with all due respect to Jake Serezda and how fantastic he is, is an extremely difficult thing to do. There's there's three guys who have done it. Yeah, there are some really good Canadian receivers who have come close and whatever else, but the point is Gittins in the right situation has been explosive. And I think, Justin, you nailed the head, nailed the nail on the head with the Anthony Lanier thing. By the way, Jason Shivers, it's not a matter of may join the Edmonton Elks. He will be the defensive coordinator of the Edmonton Elks in 2024. I think that's been the case for six weeks now. The Elks just haven't announced anything. But they almost signed Anthony Lanier away from the Saskatchewan Upfighters this past year. I don't think it's any uh, mystery that Corey Mace is going to try to bring in a bunch of guys from his defense in Toronto. Could see Dwayne Hendricks in Saskatchewan. You could see Sean Oakman in Saskatchewan. And if those guys are coming in, West to Ryderville, there's not going to be t a space or money for Anthony Lanier. And by the way, there were only two guys in the CFL last year who were regularly at that size of, you know, 285, 290 pounds playing inside and outside. They were Jake Serezna and Anthony Lanier. So I think if you're the Edmonton Elks, you're going, okay, we might give up a little bit going from Jake Serezna to Anthony Lanier, but the money's going to be the same. The production's going to be close to the same. And we get to add a top flight Canadian receiver. So 
I again, I can see the argument made from the other side that Toronto won this trade. I also think Toronto is is smart to make a preemptive strike ahead of free agency, right? Because a guy like Jake Ceresna, if he did get on the open market, by the way, it should be noted, he had an offseason roster bonus due, which is why this whole trade came about. Obviously, the Elks didn't want to pay it. And obviously, given the fact that he was traded, Ceresna wasn't willing to renegotiate his deal. So if he hits the open market, you've got a bunch of teams in. Toronto now has some security along that D line. They can afford to get raided in free agency a little bit by Corey Mace. And they're also pretty well set at Canadian receiver for the reasons you guys listed. Deshaun Brissett was a second overall pick not long ago and had a bit of a breakout year. 600 yards, five touchdowns with not a ton of starts. They also really like David Unger there, who they picked up off the scrap heap from Hamilton. Tommy Neal starting to come and do his own. So again, for that reason, I think this is a mutually beneficial trade. I do. I'm going to push back on just one thing because you seem to be starting this narrative that, well, Jake Ceresna can go out of town. We can bring in Anthony Lanier. It'll be a one-for-one. One. There's no possible way that we could have both guys on our defensive line. Why the hell not? <laughs> right? If there's two people in the league that can do what they do and at an extremely high level. I mean, I know you guys aren't quite as high on Lanier as I am. But when it comes to the analytics and the pressure numbers, he's right up there in the top five with Ceresna. But you're looking at what Toronto's doing, and they are doing basically the same thing, albeit with two different body types, but two top five pass rushers in the league that they are bringing in to the same D-line who they are paying accordingly, and they are going to invest in that position. And I think if you look at the playoffs and look at the teams that have success in the CFL, strong defensive lines, pretty good indicator that you're going to be a good football team. And the Edmonton Elks just got worse on that defensive line. And, they were okay. I think it was one of their more their stronger positions with Ceresna there and AC Leonard. But if you had added another piece on top and made that truly a threatening pass rush instead of trotting out Noah Curtis every single day to, to try and get after the quarterback, well, maybe you'd actually be a functional defense like Chris Jones used to have a reputation for fielding. He doesn't right now, and I think this made his team worse. What's interesting to me when these big trades happen in the CFL, which is very rare, is let's think of it like this. If you're the Edmonton Elks and you're shopping Jake Ceresna around the league, do we think that Chris Jones maximized the returns of him by getting Curly Gittins Jr., who, yes, has a 1,000 yards on his resume that season in 2022, but it should be said finished the last season in 2023 – with a hip injury that required some surgery and he didn't necessarily have a great finish there. So if the Elks are shopping Ceresna around the league, were there other better prospects that perhaps they could have gotten in return for him? No, because we've seen time and time again, look at what Odell Willis got traded for. Look what Charleston Hughes got traded for the going rate for an American approaching 30, even even if they're an elite defensive player, is like a mid-round pick because you have to absorb a significant cap hit. And American talent is supposed to be the easier side of the roster to replace. So if you can show me a past deal where a top guy has gone for, like like again, of that you know, nationality of that age, all that stuff has gone for like two first round picks and a roster player by all means, show it to me. But historically they do not fetch 1000 yard Canadian receivers who are 26. Yes. With the injury. Yes. Coming off a down year, but still I can't think of a past precedent where this, this type of player has fetched so much. Oh, Charleston Hughes got traded to Hamilton for like a bucket of footballs and some tape. I think it was like a fourth round pick. And then he That's got Curly Gittins Jr. That's not fourth Curly Gittins Jr. And no, and Curly Gittins Jr. JC is wrong. Was a third round pick up near the top of the third round out of Wilfred Laurier. So the jumbo cheese. There's, there's going to be a third round this year, Hodge. That's my point. 
<laughs> yeah, and you're going to get a thousand yard receiver. This receiver class, as you know, is not strong in 2024. There hasn't been a good Eight. receiver class for a while in the CFL draft. Tommy Neal is out there producing right now for the Which Toronto Argonauts. Great. And that's great for Tommy Neal. I like Tommy Neal as a teamer. I like him as a spot slot back, but he's not getting a thousand yards. And if he does in the future, good for him, but he hasn't done it. Curly Gittins Jr. Oh. is in the prime of his career. He's 26 years old. He's done something that like five Canadian receivers have done in the last 10 years. I, I don't think that, that getting him back should be seen as, as a poor trade. Hodge, I'm surprised you didn't bring up. I thought you were going to lambaste me with the one example that would jump out to everybody, Alex Hall for Patty Newfeld. Well, that to me is a different situation. Alex Hall got traded mid-season, and for the uninitiated, this is a trade that took place in 2013 between the Winnipeg Blue Bombers and the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. Alex Hall went before the trade deadline to bolster Saskatchewan's pass rush for their Grey Cup championship run, which, by the way, was successful, winning it on home soil for the first and only time in franchise history. The other way, Patrick Newfelt was considered a project. He was in, I believe it was the 2010 CFL Combine. There was somebody else on this podcast who participated in that same <laughs> Combine. And I think actually outperformed Patrick Newfelt on the bench. I looked it up recently. Really? Eddie, yes. Eddie Steele. <laughs> I think did 35 reps on the bench in 2010. Patrick Newfelt did like 12. Like he was considered a very raw offensive line prospect. The Riders started him at tackle in 2011. He played a couple of games, was a turnstile, and the fans hated him despite him being one of their own. And they parked him on the bench for a couple of years where he th hypothetically got better and they shipped him out of town. And yes, it's easy in hindsight to go, well, they gave him up for. Patrick Newfelt wasn't an all-star for the first time until 2021. He was not an all-star until he was in his 30s, and he's still playing at a very high level. Extremely talented, intelligent player. I always love chatting with Patrick Newfelt to Winnipeg. But to say that he got traded for a Canadian all-star offensive lineman is not true. At the time, he got traded for an offensive lineman who was considered a bust, who the fans did not like, and was considered soft and weak and developed into a top-tier top -tier offensive lineman. So I don't think that's a fair comp at all. I didn't think it was a fair comp. I was just saying I thought you were going to roast me for saying that you shouldn't be trading an American pass rusher for a Canadian with upside. But I also think that that trade was mutually beneficial. The Saskatchewan Rough Riders needed to win that Grey Cup. They needed to win it. They were the second team in the West Division. They needed to upgrade. They did, and it paid off. I, I think the mm -hmm. Riders would make that trade again all day, and the Bombers would also make that same trade all day. Why? Because in 2013, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers were one of the worst teams in the history of professional sports. Good God. <laughs> Moving on. Those same Riders announced their new coaching staff, bringing Markway McDaniel, Josh Bell, Edwin Harrison, J.C. Sherritt, Philip Daniels, Jordan Lennon, and Jeff Higgins to Riderville. Almost a brand new coaching staff under head coach Corey Mace. Which of those names stands out to you the most? Well, the, there's a lot that stand out here, but to me, it's the new defensive run game coordinator slash linebackers coach, J.C. Sherritt, because this is a guy I really thought we had lost forever in the CFL, who was on a trajectory to stick down south in the college ranks and have a nice little career down there for the young initiated J.C. Sherrick, of course, the all-star linebacker in Edmonton, loved him as a player, very cerebral, smaller guy who had to overcome some of his physical limitations and put up 100 tackle seasons. But after he retired, he went down. He was the defensive coordinator at Cal Poly for a couple of seasons, then had assistant stints at Auburn and Washington State. Those are big-time schools. It seemed like he was going to be in that NCAA coach Coaching cycle for a long time. Now he's back up to Canada with the Riders. I think he's going to be a real steal for them at that position. A guy who can eventually develop into a defensive coordinator potentially in the CFL based on the way he played and the fact that he's done it before at the FCS level. So I really like that hiring in particular. It's Josh Bell for me. And the major reason is 
the Toronto Argonauts secondary, especially last year. Those guys were ball hawks. I think Bell will have a big impact on the defensive scheme and the way they approach it overall, working so closely with Mace. I think he can have a big impact in Saskatchewan where, quite frankly, they got to get better in a lot of places. But especially that back end had kind of gotten stale and there were some guys back there that they needed to move on from. And rightfully so, it looks like they're going to do that for the most part. So I think Bell can have a major impact in that secondary in Saskatchewan. A couple of things stand out to me. One is how young this staff is. Corey Mace is, I believe, 38. He's not yet celebrated his 40th birthday and almost everybody else on the staff is the same way. I did the math. 36% of the staff played for the Calgary Stampeders <laughs> in 2015, which is wild. That is more recently than the decade-old trade Dunk referred to a moment ago. And by the way, Mark Mueller was already an assistant with Calgary at that time. So if you include him as an assistant, almost half of Saskatchewan's new coaching staff was part of the Calgary Stampeders less than a decade ago. That's notable. The other thing that I find notable is Josh Bell, I think, will bring potentially some defensive backs over from the Toronto Argonauts. Guys like Jamal Peters, for instance, are pending free agents. Robert T. Daniels, a pending free agent. Well, what about Edwin Harrison? Edwin Harrison has been brought in as the O-line coach. He played O-line for the Calgary Stampeders for six seasons. But Edwin Harrison has been hired as the O-line coach after previously serving as the running backs coach in Toronto, helping A.J. Olette become a household name in the CFL and a guy who could obviously upgrade the backfield in Ryderville. So not only do we think that maybe Corey Mace could bring in some defensive linemen, Josh Bell help recoup some DBs. I wonder if A.J. Olette could be in green and white in 2024. Can you imagine the fervor in Ryder Nation if he came out in that first game, carrying Thor's hammer with the mullet in tow, my God, Regina would never be the same. It seems like a perfect fit. But there is one more name I do want to mention just in passing before we move on, and that's Philip Daniels, because I think this is really interesting, the hiring of the new defensive line coach. Of course, the father of Toronto Argonauts receiver, DeVaris Daniels and a former coach for the Philadelphia Eagles in the NFL. You guys were there two years ago at the Grey Cup when we were talking to that Argonauts team. And I was speaking to Pinball Clemens and trying to get him to discuss the fact, oh, are you going to give another one of your famous speeches to fire up the team? Like, how often do you speak to the locker room? He said, nah, I don't do that. When I need a speech, I call Philip Daniels in to to do a guest speech for me because that guy is so inspirational. He's more inspirational than me. That's saying something if pinball Clemens thinks you're a better motivational speaker than he is. So Philip Daniels has a little something. Clearly Corey Mace saw it when he was with the Toronto Argonauts and is bringing him in for his first full-time gig in the CFL. And by the way, we're talking about a coach who's 50 and is ancient compared to everybody else. On <laughs> He's 50. It's like an average age for a professional football coach. And he is dust compared to everybody else. Wild. Olevi Mitchell, Jake Mayer, Trevor Harris, and Jeremiah Mazzoli have agreed to rework contracts with their respective teams. Which one is the most significant and why? This is a difficult question. But the most significant one to me is Trevor Harris because the Rough Riders are going all in on him. He gets a $250,000 signing bonus in exchange for right around $25,000 of cap space for the Riders. And it means that they're committed to him for better or for worse. Now, I know he's working off an injury. Mark Mueller is talking about building a rocket ship around him. But this is a big season for Trevor Harris and the – playing future for him in the CFL. He's gone on the record multiple times as saying he wants to play until he's 40, if not over 40. He's a big proponent of the TB12 method. Of course, Tom Brady played into his 40s at a high level in the NFL. I think Harris can do that, but there's a whole new regime here, and Corey Mace has agreed that this is going to be their guy at least for 2024, and we'll see what happens going forward. A lot of that decision will be made 
by what Harris does on the field. And I hate even bringing this up, but if he gets injured again, because there's already some Rough Riders fans in my timeline when I put this out there that we're talking about, they feel like he's injured all the time, that feel like maybe he's getting too injured. So he needs to be healthy on the field and productive in 2024 to have a shot to continue to be a $500,000 man in this league going forward. I don't want to cut off Hodge too much here, but Dunk, are you out to lunch? Like <laughs> Trevor Harris, like those four? 25,000. 250K, 20, bro. 25. Well, he was going to make that anyway. You, what you're talking about is $25,000 worth of cap space. That's nothing. Like that's a, a third of the minimum salary. I'm not talking in the about CFL. the cap space, though. Yeah, but he was already under contract. That, that's the only significant part of this deal. That's if a we're ridiculous, talking, guys. A if ridiculous we're ta- take. If we're talking <laughs> about out to lunch, the first people who need to get checked here are the Ryder fans complaining about Trevor Harris breaking a bone. This is not a soft tissue thing. He was involved in a free kit and broke a bone. And by the way, over the course of his career, Trevor Harris has essentially stayed perfectly healthy. He had a shoulder injury that held him out of five games in 2019. Other than that, he has really never missed time, which is more than can be said for most CFL quarterbacks or quarterbacks in professional football. We all know the NFL had horrible quarterback injuries almost all across the league this past season. Even guys who always stay healthy still got hurt. So Trevor Harris, no, he's not injury prone. He just had a freak accident. It's allowed to happen. Hits happen. He broke a bone. It's not his fault. But secondly, before I was rudely interrupted by Jumbo (laughs) Cheese, the answer to this question is not Trevor Harris. The answer to this question is Jeremiah Masoli, who provided clarity in the nation's capital. We know Red Blacks fans have been wondering this all offseason. What's going to happen with Jeremiah? Because he has made $500,000 in and around that the last two seasons apiece and played only five games. Again, not his fault. The Achilles injury is a freak injury. He was targeted in 2022 when he suffered the leg fracture. It also was not his fault that he suffered a subsequent infection while recovering from that injury in hospital. However, as Dunk reported first, he took a $45,000 signing bonus to rework his deal to include just under $150,000 in hard money and be worth up to just under $250,000 in playtime. This officially means that Jeremiah Jeremiah Masoli has gone from what I would call QB1 money to definitely QB2 money. This is not borderline starter money. This is a talented backup contract. And look, Jeremiah Masoli has said he's probably not going to be back till July or August. You know, Bob Dice didn't rule him out for training camp when he spoke to the media via video conference this past week. But obviously, at the age of 35, he's not going to recover as quickly as some other guys would. And frankly, there's no reason to rush him back. But what this does mean is that the Auto Red Blacks clearly have the space to add a QB1. We know Tyree Adams is on a rookie deal. We know Dustin Crum is on a rookie deal. It appears to be a foregone conclusion that Nick Arbuckle will not be back with the team. It's possible Nick Arbuckle doesn't sign another CFL contract. Clearly, the Red Blacks have money to add a QB1. By all accounts, it appears to be Drew Brown. Interesting times with the Auto Red Blacks. And let's go through this question because we got four options. Let, let's weigh them out. It's not Trevor Harris, as I've said already, because that <laughs> deal, he was getting paid anyway. They already committed to him. It's a paper car, uh, deal for $25,000 worth of cap space, which I'm sure will help the riders they add a very nice, him, a very nice depth piece. They no, could have released, released him. Release him. He's I'm making basically the same money that he was making before. They just reworked it so that he makes a little bit more after taxes, and they get, again, not enough to sign one whole player. They can sign like somebody's leg. Like, is, is that a good enough <laughs> ad for you? Anyway, it's ridiculous. It's not Trevor Harris. Is it Jake Mayer? Not really, because it's the same situation, basically the same contract again. As much as I think it's more significant that Calgary is sticking with Mayer than Saskatchewan sticking with Trevor Harris. 
And that's not the answer. I think Jeremiah Mazzoli, you have a very good point there, Hodge. That's a respectable answer. I, I respect what you have to say about that. But the obvious one is Bo Levi Mitchell. And I can't believe I've let you two talk and we've gotten right here and no one has mentioned <laughs> Bo Levi Mitchell. I mean, that this might be the longest we've ever gone without mentioning Bo Levi Mitchell <laughs> any time in the CFL. The what does this mean for Nathan nice Rourke? Rourke? What does it mean for <laughs> Nathan Don't get Rourke? me started. <laughs> but that's a significant deal, not only because – it creates significant cap space for the Hamilton Tiger Cats and keeps Bo there. They say he's got the leg up on the starting job. And I mean, his, his pay cut, he went from 522,000 in hard money that he was supposed to be owed next season to $225,000 in hard money next season. That's more than half, right? He's, He's halved his contract. Now, there's the opportunity to make more with playtime incentives if he can stay healthy. But still, that's a significant pay decrease for a player that was among the highest paid quarterbacks in the league just last season. And it's a significant investment from the uh, Tiger Cats perspective to say he's going to be in the building still. And we still think he can start football games for us, which was an open question. But even more than that, it took one of the major players that we thought was going to be on this quarterback market that teams like Ottawa could have gone after, that teams like Edmonton could have gone after if he hit the open market at the right time. He was no longer in play for them. Right, because Hamilton kept him in the building. It was a huge domino to fall this offseason for that team and for the CFL as a whole. And that's why it's the obvious answer to this question. And I can't believe that I have to tell you guys this. Bolivar Mitchell was never going anywhere else, bro. He's bought in or purchased, I should say, when he signed that contract, a house near Hamilton. He wants to stay in southern Ontario to be close to TSN because that's likely going to be his next move after football. And everyone knew he was going to take a cut. The reason that Trevor Harris is significant to me is not for the salary cap space. Let's get this straight, okay, Jumbo Cheese? It's because of the amount paid to him. The only player to this point, and I think this will hold true throughout 2024, that will be paid a bigger lump sum in the CFL this year is Zach Kolaris, who has led the Blue Bombers to four straight Grey Cups and has – Two MLPs on his resume. He collected a $300,000 roster bonus on January 15th. So we're putting Trevor Harris, by virtue of this one payday, in a similar category to Calaris. And I think we would all agree that he's not there yet until he wins a great cup. A couple of other things I think that need to be said here. already in his, in his contract, Dunk. Like, that doesn't change just because they converted it into a but signing they bonus to give instead it to of him. an off. The writers no, could have went to him and said, hey, they weren't gonna cut you him. were hurt last year. We want to sign some more players. Can you take a little bit more of a haircut? They could yeah, have said, you, Jared, you, look at what Masoli's making. Look at what Bo Levi Mitchell's Mitchell. making. We're going to pay you more than that, but not not much more. We're, you're not a $500,000 guy. You could, you could do that to Zach Caleros, too. Like, if we're talking in crazy lads, you no, could go you to can't. any player. You, yeah, are you, you can. You can are you do it to Are you comparing the season that Zach Kolaris had in 2023 to the season that Trevor Harris had in 2023? He is. No, he that's did. not what I'm saying. But we knew that they were invested <laughs> in Trevor Harris. We've talked about it. It's not a soft tissue industry injury. I just I think this whole line of of questioning is ridiculous. It's it's not that significant of a move. It's just the status quo. I think the riders well, maintaining the status Mitchell quo. I, I, I'm, yes. I actually agree with you, JC, that Bo is a bigger story than Trevor Harris, but I don't think that the riders sticking with a guy who's almost 40, who barely played last year at half a million a year. I, yeah, I think that's very significant. I do. He didn't I'm not start saying starting that. football games until he was 30 years old. He's, he's like, I'm he's not got saying that Trevor Harris isn't worth it. I'm just talking about the sheer amount of money. That they're giving him. That's all. Talking about guaranteed money. A couple other things I want to note. In terms of Jeremiah Masoli, I think this deal, and this is rare that I say that, I hope I don't say this too much, I think is win-win for both sides, okay? Sean Burke, the general manager, is sitting there knowing that because Masoli is injured, he can't release him 
before that January 15th, $100,000 bonus. I don't know if a lot of people understand that. He would have been able to release Masoli because Masoli had a clause in the previous contract before this renegotiated one about reporting to training camp and passing his physical. That would not have happened. So Burke's sitting there going, okay, either way here, kind of, I'm going to have to give Masoli some money. I'm going to give him $100,000 to potentially not be with us, or I'll give him $100,000 plus, what was it, around 33000 in hard money, so 133 in hard money to have a veteran backup who knows Tommy Condal's offense, who has started games in this league, and in an ideal world is going to be healthy at some point this season. So for $33,000 in hard money, I thought it made a lot of sense for Burke to keep Masoli in the nation's capital. And it makes sense from Masoli's perspective because he knows Condell's offense. And if he does get healthy, you never know what's going to happen. If Drew Brown does indeed go there, he's a guy that they can rely upon and he has a job. It's easier to get a job in 2025, even if it's a backup, if you have a job, I think there possibly would have been other teams that could have signed Masoli if he got free, even around training camp, but that would have been a much more difficult thing. So I think, it's a rare win-win for all sides. The Bolivai Mitchell deal is very intriguing from the sense, and Hodge and I were talking about this while we were waiting for JC to wake up on the West Coast, <laughs> because the Tiger Cats have a bunch of money to spend now. Yes, there's going to be some higher-paid guys. Brandon Revenberg is certainly up there. Tim White is going to command over $200,000 to get him re-signed. But Hamilton with Scott Milanovic and Ed Hervey, new faces in those positions, can go out and get some guys if they want, or they can go the Alouettes route and at least turn this roster over and make it younger with scouting fines. So I think that presents a situation in Hamilton where we're going to see this team look much different in 2024. Thank you for illustrating the injury issue, by the way, Dunk. I listened back to last week's show, and I should have noted that because he's hurt, the Red Blacks can't just cut Masoli. They would be able to before camp, but not before the bonus. So I apologize to our listeners for not illustrating that more effectively. Thank you for doing so. Happy to, bro. I got you. JC, do you have anything else you want to say for yourself? <laughs> Tapped out. I'm, I'm still flabbergasted. I was sitting here looking, reading this question off my notes, being like, oh, God, I'm going to have to talk about Jake Mayer. I don't want to <laughs> talk about Jake Mayer. I thought it was going to, you were going to talk about Bo. Hodge was going to talk about Mazzoli. And I was going to be stuck with Mayer because Trevor Harris wasn't even in the conversation. And here you go going off the bat. I'm, I'm shocked. Are you tapped out or are you still conked out? Did you have a good sleep? I had a late night, okay? Okay. Okay, that sounds intriguing. <laughs> JC after dark. We'll save that for another day. Hodge, you wrote a column listing the contract status of nearly, and I stress nearly, every CFL and head coach and general manager. Dave Dickinson, the head coach and GM in Calgary, refused to answer. He kind of dodged you in a polite way. While Ed Hervey and Scott Milanovic in Hamilton did the same. I think one of those guys called you, Johnny and had this wry little smile that was like, don't ask me that question ever again. Did their answers surprise you? I don't know if surprise is the right word, but they disappointed me. Right. And, and let's preface this by saying that the contract status of head coaches and GMs didn't used to matter. Right. They were irrelevant. And if you haven't read the column, please do go to three nation.com, read the column. But when the CFL introduced the operations cap following the 2018 season, it meant that the amount of non-football personnel, we're talking coaches, scouts, GMs, all that kind of stuff, became limited. What also became limited was how much they could be paid. And so teams, the result has been they are more careful about these decisions because they don't want to fire somebody with two years or three years left on their deal and have to eat all of that money against the operations cap, right? We saw the Edmonton Elks do it after 2021 when they cleaned house, they fired Brock Sunderland, Jamie Elizondo, they even fired the president, Chris Preston, though presidents conveniently are not part of the operations cap. Uh, And obviously it it put them in a really bad way. It affected how they could go about their hiring process for 22. It affected who they could hire for 22. It, It was a nightmare. So this is now a big issue. And interestingly, what I found is four teams, those four teams are Winnipeg, Saskatchewan, 
uh, Montreal, and uh, wasn't who else? Who's the fourth? I'm, I'm forgetting who the fourth one was at the top of my head. But some teams, the point is, are announcing contract lengths for their head coaches and GMs. Some teams are not announcing them, and so I asked each person face to face, I guess virtually via video conference. When is your contract up? And to the credit of the folks in Ottawa, to the folks in Toronto, to the folks in BC, they answered the question. Hamilton and Calgary were the only two spots that did not answer this question. And Ed Hervey, the GM in Hamilton, went as far as to say it's actually club policy not to talk about this, as I noted in the article. And I just want to say publicly with all due respect to the decision makers in Calgary and Hamilton, this is an unbelievably stupid policy that is nonsense garbage. Fans who pay their hard-earned money to sit in those seats, which those teams desperately need, and follow their teams and follow them on social media and support them and buy the merchandise, absolutely and unequivocally deserve to know how long the people running that organization are under contract. I didn't ask them how much money they make. I didn't ask what their postal code is for their social insurance number. I asked, how long does your contract run with your team? And to have a club policy stating that that shouldn't be the case is idiocy, in my opinion. I'm not saying the people running those organizations are stupid or idiots because that would be extremely disrespectful. I'm saying this one particular policy is unbelievably short-sighted, especially for a league that needs as much coverage as it can possibly get, refusing to answer basic questions, very basic questions the fans deserve to know the answer to, seems like poor practice. And the league, in my opinion, should step up here and create some type of league-wide policy where teams that don't make this type of information publicly available, again, I'm not talking about salaries, I'm just talking about contract lengths, There should be repercussions, in my opinion, for teams that don't do that because it's bad for the league. It's bad for fans in Calgary. The last time that the Stampeders announced a contract extension for Dave Dickinson was 2017. That's seven (laughs) years ago. They have not announced an extension for Dave Dickinson, their head coach and GM, in in over half a decade. That that's insane to me. And this some this is something that needs to be rectified, in my opinion. You hit the nail right on the head there, Hodge, on all your points. But the thing that I want to touch on is like the marketing side, the attention side, the fact that we need to generate conversation in the CFL. It's a ridiculous policy just in general, not to inform your fans information that they need to know to have properly informed discussions about your football team. But Every year we get on some of these calls and inevitably someone asks the softball question of uh, where you think the league is at right now. What do you think of this? What do you think of that? And somebody's going to sit there and say, well, you know, I wish we marketed it a little bit better. And, you know, the players are the stars and let's uh, let's make sure we put them in front of the fans and yada, 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 all those things. And then they don't provide people the information that they need to actually talk about these things through the off season. It goes the same with players where usually we get a contract length, but not always. And we never get any monetary finger- figures unless we report it on three down nation, right? Like this stuff should be public. And I understand there's a little bit of hesitation when it comes to the money because it's not the same as it is in other big four pro sports leagues where it's massive million dollar figures and people are a little bit embarrassed. But if you want your league to be held to that same standard and to be talked about in that same way and you want to generate discussion throughout the offseason, then you need to know every detail, contract lengths and contract numbers for anything that is cap-related. And now coaches are cap-related should be made public in my mind. There is no excuse not to. Guys, I know you're all hot and bothered about this, but... This is one of the reasons that Three Down Nation has come to be what it is, is because we went after this information with fervor and full credit to Mr. John Hodge for asking all of these people this difficult question. It is very uncomfortable even just to ask it. And I knew going into this when Hodge had this idea, and this is why I want to give him full credit, that there were going to be specific people 
who would not really like this question, and I was right on at least a couple of them. So full credit to Hodge for asking it, writing it, but inevitably, just like most things that we do at the site and taking what the fans want to talk and listen and read about, we'll get these details, just like we do with the contract. So I understand people wanting salaries to be public, but you know all the top earners at their respective positions will have articles every single year at Three Down Nation as players. That said, and I know you guys alluded to this in terms of the money that head coaches and general managers and on down those lists are making, there have been players that have said to me, well, you guys do all the player contracts. How come you don't do the GMs and the head coaches or the coordinators? And I think that is a valid argument pushing back against us, that the players have their contracts out there for better or for worse. So at some point, that's going to be another challenge for us we do know the total of the football operations cap, and you can kind of guess based on some of the things you hear around the league, but it's not the facts that we present for the players. So I think that is something that in the future we need to be better at, but the CFL could overall be more proactive with all of this because you look at, and specifically I think of the NBA, there's a lot of trade talk, especially in that league and more trades seem to happen there that you can go on websites and match up the salaries for how a trade would look. But for example, the deal that we talked about off the top, most fans, you know, largely without three down nation can't match up a trade like Jake Serezna for Curly Gittins Jr. Because they don't know the salary cap implications there. It's not made public. So I think both of what you said has a lot of validity in terms of this league becoming less secretive and more public with some of these key details. First of all, I appreciate the props. I don't consider it a difficult question. I think it's a basic question. I think it should be a non-issue question. Uh, and I'm also fine to have people not answer a question or to have it rubbed in the wrong way because that's just part of the job. It doesn't bother me. Um, one thing I will also say is for clarity, the three teams that announced lengths were Winnipeg, Saskatchewan, and Montreal – Edmonton did not announce the length of Chris Jones' deal initially, but they did reveal it at his introductory press conference. So they're kind of a fourth one. BC, Toronto, and Ottawa have all announced deals, but not the lengths. Hamilton, kind of same thing, because they just hired, obviously, these guys in, in new roles. Calgary is the only team that, that appears to have signed Dave Dickinson to multiple extensions and not even announced that an extension has taken place. And Calgary, maybe more so than any other team in the league, desperately needs coverage, and they're not announcing basic stuff that Stampeders fans obviously really want to know. And I'll mention this too, guys. And yes, this would actually probably be a bad thing for three down for the reasons that you illustrate, Dunk. We feed off a lot of this information that other outlets don't get. But something Farhan Lalji tweeted the other day I thought was really smart. The Atlanta Falcons announced that they'd interviewed Bill Belichick for their head coaching role. Why is it not a requirement for all teams to announce when they've completed an interview for a GM or head coaching job. It would provide news for outlets across this country, a lot of whom do not have the money to pay a CFL-specific reporter anymore. You don't have to spend a lot of time in a newsroom or a press box during a CFL event to know that the media is hurting, it's shrinking, there's not as many of us on the ground with boots on the ground trying to provide this information for fans who care. And it would be great for the teams to get that recognition. And it'd be great for the candidates because I think we've all experienced talking to guys who have done interviews. And it's like, well, can I report that? And they're like, well, I, I want it out there because it'd be good for me personally to have people know that I interviewed for this job. But it also looks tacky if I leak it and other candidates aren't leaking it. And they don't want to frustrate the team that's obviously trying to hire them. Or, or at least considering hiring them. So that is even another very simple change that you could make is when you conduct a head coaching interview, release a press release and just announce that we've conducted this interview. It would be a basic way to get fans talking during the off season and would make life easier for the media. Again, three down, we generally get this information. So it might even be a bad thing for us. I'm just saying as a critic of the league, this is something the league would be smart to do and it would be a small change that would that I think would make fans a lot happier. 
some of the irony in this, and JC, you experienced this firsthand, is the fact that Dave Dickinson would like the CFL to have more media coverage, right, JC? Uh, <laughs> I was, I was going to say, him not giving his contract information, that's pretty Bush League, guys. That's Bush League. <laughs> this is a reference that none of, our, none of our listeners are getting right now. Can you I, go behind the curtain a little bit for the yeah, I'll, viewers I'll, and I'll, listeners? I'll take you behind the curtain. Well, I mean, Dave, Dave was uh, a little animated after his playoff loss to the BC Lions, and he entered the press room for his uh, post-loss press conference. Um, and initially, we thought it was joking, but he looked at all of us and he said, well, you guys bothered to show up today. And he like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he proceeded to rip into us for not attending Calgary's press conference the day before uh, and called all of the media members Bush League and then sat down and insisted that we start the press conference and get the cameras rolling. So uh, I was not at the press conference for full clarity. I was coaching a football game uh, on that uh, particular moment. So I was unable to attend. But in defense of all my media colleagues who are print journalists and were not able to attend, their deadlines were at 2.30 uh, p.m. Pacific time. And Calgary, in their infinite wisdom, decided to hold their press conference at 3 p.m. after the print deadlines of everyone who was supposed to be in attendance. Uh, so there was no point in them showing up at all. But Dave Dickinson uh, was still rather animated about the whole situation and decided to to take it out on the uh on the reporters here in Vancouver. And I seem to recall you told us he didn't just call you Bush League. You're omitting at least one expletive. Which... Yes. There was an expletive involved. Yeah. Dave Dickinson does swear, guys. I can confirm it. <laughs> and look, the guy had just lost a, a playoff game, so like I appreciate his frustration. But to rip the media for a lack of attention and then to not answer basic questions is is not cool. And uh, I think that we are right to criticize the Calgary Stampeders organization and the Hamilton Tiger Cats organization for these policies that are not serving CFL fans or the communities in which they play, the communities they rely on for support. Hopefully they change in the near future, which again, as we've illustrated, would potentially be to the detriment of three down. But I'm happy with that if it serves the CFL community as a whole, because our fans deserve this type of information. Quantez Stiggers has declared for the NFL draft, though he remains under contract with the Toronto Argonauts through the 2024 season. Do you think the 22-year-old has a future in the NFL? I do, and I think there's a fairly good chance that he gets drafted. We all saw what he was able to do as a rookie in the CFL, performing at an exceptionally high level against men in professional competition that's something that i think nfl teams are going to take note of he's a guy they would have signed if he wasn't draft eligible but because of his unique path this is a guy who did not call play any college football for for personal reasons had to go through the fan controlled football league before he came to the cfl and it's now finally just three years of high school which is the bar for entry into the NFL draft, this is the first time that NFL teams are going to take a crack at him. And it's a fascinating situation because he is under contract with the T Toronto Argonauts and the NFL window for the CFL closes on February 13th. So theoretically, or, or in fact, the NFL draft takes place after the Argonauts have to release him, right? So if, if he was working out for a team and they offered him a contract up until February 13th, the Argonauts under the window are obligated to release him. If he gets drafted or there's interest in, in him as an undrafted free agent, they're under no legal obligation to let him out of that contract at this point. Now, it seems like they are going to at least think about doing that. And Pinball Clemens, in his comments to us last week, seemed to indicate that if he was drafted, the Argos would certainly let him leave 
And right now they're allowing him to work out for NFL teams and attend the East West Shrine Bowl as a player who's not gone to university, which is a significant opportunity for him to gain some exposure to NFL scouts down south of the border. It's looking good for him right now, but that is a uh, it's going to be an interesting situation to track as we go through this process because the Argos are going to have to be the bigger man here and release him if there's NFL interest. I really hope they do the right thing. And by the way, Pinball Clemens was talking. It seems like they will like to make this guy play the last year, I do believe, of his rookie deal, making less than $100,000 instead of going to the NFL for potentially making millions. Whether or not he gets drafted, guys, if he has a chance to sign as a priority undrafted free agent, you got to let him seek out that opportunity. And I think that's just going to help the relationship in the long run if it doesn't pain out in the NFL that he's going to want to come back and play for the Toronto Argonauts. He's not going to hold any ill will. So I really hope that happens. I think based on what Clemens said, it probably will. But this story is just unbelievable. It's one of the ones that seems like it's so CFL that it's unique and cool. And it's great that he has this chance because of what he proved in the CFL at such a young age. Very unbelievable story. Well, the exact quote from Pinball was, quote, if he does get drafted, there is a good chance that we may give him the ability to be mobile, close quote. So, and when pressed, Clemens did not guarantee that the Argos would allow him out of his deal. And it should be noted, as, as JC said, they're under no obligation to do so. Right, They could very easily say, look, we gave you your first opportunity to play real professional football. We have you under contract for a song in 2024. We're probably losing Jamal Peters to the Saskatchewan Rough Riders via free agency. And you're an all-star caliber player. There's no way we're letting you walk. You can try the NFL in 2025 when you're, 20, when you're 23 years old. Maybe within 100% of their right to do that. So I commend the Argos for not standing in this young man's way. And, uh, you know, will he get drafted? I don't know. I think it's tough to, to get drafted in the NFL, obviously, especially as a kid who didn't play college. But I will say this. I have met Quantez Stiggers. He has an NFL body type. He is about the same size as, for example, um, a, a guy who I met for the first time in person at Grey Cup, who spent a lot of time, obviously, terrorizing opposing receivers in the CFL and then translated that into a Pro Bowl caliber NFL career in Delvin Bro. Like he is that true six foot, 200 pound cover guy who is physical and fast and I think very well suited to the American game. So it would be at all surprising if he at the very least was under, I think it's a foregone conclusion, he'll be under contract in the NFL next season. The question is, does he get drafted, especially with a pretty unique background? We'll see if teams hold that against him. If teams don't care, it'll be a fun story to follow up on. If he looks like a man amongst boys at the East-West Shrine Bowl, which he very well could be as the only person there with professional experience, that's going to really elevate his stock. That'll give him a chance to push into that drafted thing. And the thing that we haven't really talked, I think there's two elements that we haven't really talked about here when it comes to Stiggers and this decision. First of all, I think the Argonauts have to release him, not from a legal standpoint necessarily, but from a fact, a backlash standpoint, can you imagine if they didn't, if he was a draft pick, not only would that make news across Canada and make the league look mm -hmm. terrible, it would make news in whatever NFL city that he had been drafted in and potentially across the U.S. as well. And it would just be egg on the face of the Toronto Argonauts and the CFL in general if they did not al allow him to be granted his release. I've also had some people suggest to me that it might not be legal entirely to prevent him from going to the NFL in that situation, that it would be dicey. The laws around that aren't entirely clear and they could open themselves up to a court challenge. Now I'm not the person telling me that was not a lawyer, but he has some experience dealing with, um, employment law in his previous work. And he was suggesting to me that that's something that 
lawyers could get involved with. And I know in the past when CFL players, this is dating back many, many years, have not been granted releases. Some have threatened to sue and lawsuits have begun, I believe, in the past. So that's not entirely unprecedented. This situation in itself isn't unprecedented either, right? It hasn't happened in a while that a player has been drafted directly from the CFL. I don't believe it's happened this century, but the last one I could find was 1999. Jermaine Haley, defensive tackle for the Toronto Argonauts, went in round seven to Miami. And it used to happen with remarkable frequency back before uh, underclassmen were allowed to declare for the NFL draft. They come up here to Canada, play a couple seasons, and then they get drafted by the NFL. Lots of big name players have had that happen to them. Jerron Bolden, uh, Joe Horn, Jake Scott, just to name a few. A number of players I put on my CFL to NFL all time team earlier this year. So there is a precedent. It's just an unusual situation in the 21st century because we haven't had to go through it in more than two decades. I don't think it's possible for him to get drafted and not cut by the Argos simply because no one would draft him without assurance that he'd be cut. But Mm -hmm. I get what you're saying. It would be a bad look, even if he got a UDFA deal and the Argos refused. So I, I get what you're saying, JC. It's now time for Hodges heritage moment on this day in 2008, Kent Austin was hired by Ole Miss to serve as the team's offensive coordinator. The longtime CFL quarterback had served as the head coach of the Saskatchewan Rough Riders for just one season in 2007, winning the Grey Cup and the Anastuckus Trophy. Austin spent two seasons with the Rebels before being hired as the head coach at Cornell, where he went 11-19 and 19 over three seasons before returning north of the border as the head coach and GM of the Hamilton Tiger Cats. He spent five seasons with the Tabbies, posting a 36-44 and 44 record with two Grey Cup appearances before stepping down as the club's head coach partway through the 2017 season. He later served as the offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach at Liberty University for four years before becoming an offensive analyst at Auburn this past year. My question for you boys, we'll start with JC since he's wearing a green toque. If Kent Austin had stayed in Saskatchewan for longer, more than just one year, would he have won them a second Grey Cup during his tenure? That's a tough question. I, I, I'm going to say yes. I think he would have won them a second Grey Cup. I think he's proven to be an excellent coach. I think he has a way with quarterbacks, and there have been some times where Saskatchewan has needed that since he left. Um, so I'm going to go with, yes, and Austin would have won the team another great cup. I'll say emphatically, no. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to elaborate on the reason why, or do you want to go to the three-minute drill? <laughs> Look at the track record with, record with the Tiger Cats, man. Like, yes, Zach Hilaris was there, and JC talks about having him away with quarterbacks, but, I mean, I'd like to get some of these quarterbacks off the record that they've worked with and give me their real feelings on Ken Austin. And East Division wasn't really that good when those Tiger Cats teams went to the Grey Cup. He does have a negative record as the Tiger Cats head coach. And I will also say this. It does seem to be a pattern with Ken Austin that in the first year or two he arrives to a team, the results are spectacular, and then they age like milk from there, which is to say they hit an expiration date and very quickly start to spoil. Let's go to the three-minute drill, boys. Chris Strevler is reportedly strongly considering a return to the CFL with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers as the front runners to sign him. Could you see him heading back to the peg, wearing that cowboy hat with the fur coat, even though it's like minus 50 out there right now with no <laughs> shirt on underneath? And oh, yeah, the sunglasses, too. I'll just say this. I feel a little ripped off that Chris Streveler went shirtless in the cold and everybody loved it. Yet when I do it, people are upset. That's just <laughs> really hurts my feelings. They're like, please leave Walmart. Please get out. It's, it's really upsetting. But all jokes aside, I, I mean, as much as this fit would be amazing, right? It, you know, Drew Brown goes out. Chris Streveler comes in. I get it from a bomber's perspective. I don't know where they're going to find the money. Right. Dalton Schoen is asking for the sun, the moon and the stars. Brady Oliveira is asking for the sun and the moon and the stars. They brought back, you know, what two of their starting offensive linemen. They got three more to go. Jackson Jeffcoat has no contract. Demiro Houston has no contract. 
Where is the money? That's my question. Where's the, that's why I'm skeptical. About There's a way this. to get it done, though. There's You're a way. It out. There's a way. But the point is, it's going to cost them elsewhere against the cap. Though the Bombers do seem to be happy to go over the cap by a little bit. So may, maybe that plays into it. I don't know. The BC Lions have signed star receiver Keon Hatcher to a three-year contract extension despite him suffering an Achilles injury in the West Final. Do you see him returning to the field in 2024? It's a possibility. He, as you mentioned, that Achilles injury was in the West Final. Typically, that's nine to 12 months recovery. I know Hatcher seems to believe he'll be back at the front end of that recovery period. I'm not sure he's going to make it there, but certainly we won't be seeing him until after Labor Day, potentially not until much, much later into the season. But this is a great deal for BC because they've got him on lock for three years and this is a guy who went healthy i would argue is one of the best receivers in the cfl a top five guy at the position truly elite so it's good to have him locked up long term maple leaf sports and entertainment has hired keith pelly as their new president is that an encouraging sign for argonauts fans I think it could be somewhat encouraging, and he's obviously risen in terms of his own career, but MLSC is usually mostly focused, and people in the CFL don't want to hear it, but the Toronto Maple Leafs, the Toronto Raptors, and Toronto FC, probably even above the Argos. So hopefully with a CFL background, it does help. I think there's a possibility there, but until I see it, I won't believe it. The Ticats have signed offensive lineman Jordan Murray to a two-year contract extension. Do you expect him to hold down the blind side in Steeltown this year? Well, here's the question. Joel Figueroa is supposed to be the left tackle. He's due a large offseason bonus on February 1st. So I'm curious to see if it'll be Murray in, Figueroa out. Because we know last season when the Ticats signed Joel Figueroa away from the BC Lions – that was when Jordan Murray was still in the NFL. So interesting to see how that plays out. Dane Evans has been hired as a quarterback coach at the high school level in Oklahoma, his home state. Do you think he'll be able to climb the coaching ranks down south? I think he's in a really nice spot. The head coach at this particular high school is also his former head coach from the University of Tulsa. So he's going to get an introduction with somebody he's familiar with at a high-level high school. Fun fact, we just talked about him, an alumnus of this particular high school in Oklahoma, Keon Hatcher, who was catching passes from Dane Evans last year. Now he's going to be coaching his old high school. Marcel Desjardins, who was fired as the general manager of the Ottawa Red Blacks near the end of the 2021 season, is back in the CFL as a special assistant to the general manager and player personnel with the Montreal Alouettes. Is that a good move? I think it probably is, but with all due respect to Marcel Desjardins, the Alouettes don't need the help. They just won the Grey Cup. And I had people told me that when Desjardins was done with the Red Blacks, that he might just burn all of his CFL memorabilia and just move on with his life. So I'm actually more surprised to see that he's back in the CFL. The Ottawa Red Blacks have re-signed Canadian special teamer Nigel Romick, the team's last remaining OG player. Does that make sense? I don't want to sound disrespectful to Nigel Romick, who has had a really good CFL career as a special teams guy. But this guy has only put up 15 special teams tackles over the last two years after being a perennial like 20 a year guy. Isn't this an opportunity for the Red Blacks to set a new culture? Like, yeah, he's an original Red Black. That means he's had five atrocious seasons over his over his, over his he's career. Still pretty good. No, I'm not saying him personally. I'm saying the team for five of the years he's been on it has been atrocious. They were awful in year one, and they've been atrocious for the last four. So when it comes to setting a team culture, maybe new blood and more new blood would be a positive thing for the Red Blacks. All, all due respect to Nigel Romick, who, again, has not personally had atrocious seasons, but by God, that team, yes, has had some atrocious seasons. The BC Lions are banking on a better showing from Taquan Mizell heading into their second season. Do you think they'll get one as they look to get more out of their running game? I don't know. I, I think... 
that Neil McAvoy has a point when he says that players usually take a jump forward in their second year. Even if you look at some of the elite running backs in the CFL, it's taken them a couple years to truly get up to speed. But I'm not convinced with Mizell and what he brings to the table. I like a little bit of a bigger running back myself. I think the CFL is designed for sort of those one cut slashers getting chunk yardage you hate running every backs time. In general though, bro. <laughs> well, the other point to this is improving the running back t- position is not going to help this team a lick until they get better on the interior of the offensive line. Thankfully for them, this is going to be a very good draft class, so it might not happen right away, but if they can add some pieces in two years, this will be a much improved offensive front. Ed Hervey told the media that Simone and Lawrence's future with the Ticats is, quote, still up for conversation, close quote. Do you think Simi HOV will be back in Steeltown? Just based on that quote, I think the chances are better that he's not. That said, there's still some time left here. But if you look in the past, Simone Lawrence has re-signed with the Tiger Cats early before even getting really close to free agency. So there's still some time left here. Herbie said he wanted to reevaluate the roster now that he's the GM and go over it with Scott Milanovic, the new head coach there. So I think that's somewhat warranted, but... Lawrence has been a stalwart on that defense for a while, but you talk to people around the league and they feel like perhaps his play, and I'm just saying this is what the people that know CFL football better than I do say, has fallen off in recent years. In story you broke, Hodge, Kenny Lawler has restructured his deal with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Will that free up some money for Dalton Schoen? Honestly, at this point, I would think it's far more likely that Dalton Schoen will be out of Winnipeg in 2024 (gasps) and staying in Winnipeg in 2024. Kenny Lawler now making $285,000 league wide boys. There are only two American receivers set to make over 200 K in 2024. There are some guys right at that number. There's some guys who will probably head over that number after free agency opens up like Tim white. But right now it's Eugene Lewis at 320. And Kenny Lawler at 285. If you're Dalton Schoen's agent, it makes no sense to take less than Kenny Lawler's getting. His numbers are better. But how can the Bombers possibly afford to pay two receivers that much money in the top three by a country mile? So that is why I think it is likely Dalton Schoen, despite this restructuring, will be elsewhere in 2024. The Las Vegas Raiders have signed breakout star Tyreek McAllister following a sensational season in Steeltown. Do you think he could make their roster? I think he's got a shot because of how versatile he is. I don't think he has ideal size, but he can play running back. You can stick him out at slot receiver. And most importantly, I think he can make this team as a returner, either returning kicks or returning punts. That doesn't have the same value it once did in the NFL. And I think the Raiders uh, you know, are okay in that regard, but, but McAllister can improve them certainly with his skill set. The Calgary Stampeders have signed Canadian linebacker Cameron Judge to an extension through 2025. Is that a smart move? It really is. This guy's a ratio breaker at the position. He's been a stud now for a number of years and proven it. I think Calgary's going along here and locking up who they feel like are some of these key players, and Judge is certainly one of them. On that note, we thank you as always for listening to the Three Down Nation podcast. Don't forget to check us out on YouTube, all that good stuff. We'll see you next week for our next episode.